We have bars on the windows and they smash dude's head up against the bar and his ears like hanging off and dangling and shit. His ear was hanging off and dangling? Yeah, you hit him on the window and the bar cut his ear and it was just like, it was nasty. It was nasty. And this is the first prison fight that I got to witness. You know? y'all welcome to today's episode i am excited i am here in hot springs hot springs hot springs arkansas man we just got done with the peer uh support conference and i'm kind of on fire man because arkansas is doing it out here like i've never seen anybody do it before this state a lot of people might think whatever they think about arkansas but arkansas's <laughs> recovery is fire y'all and i met my good friend brian donahue he's another good irish boy who's been through it man like we're going to talk about some prison we're going to talk about some addiction we're going to talk about some redemption up in this thing today so uh brian thank you for giving me the opportunity to sit down yeah. with you man yeah absolutely man it's a pleasure to be here awesome so where did it start to go wrong like early on man uh, i think it started going wrong uh whenever my parents divorced i was probably i think i was about four or five years old and so i started to kind of miss that uh attention from my mother I lived with my father, we moved here to Hot Springs. My dad started a radio state or we came here to work at a Christian radio station. And so <clears throat> that's when the whole mother uh, affection kind of left me. And so I kind of just seek for that uh, female attention ever since then. It just I think it it created a codependency issue with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you feel like later on that might have um that might have manifest into any type of like your sex life. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I, I think it had a lot to do with it. Actually, you know, it, it went through, which there are several stages to that, uh, that, that codependency and that, that wanting a female's love and attention. I think that, um, it went into that sex, that's that sex addiction and that sexual, uh, desire, you know, um, uh, it also, what I think what played a lot into it, so <clears throat> I can kind of relate with you and your experience as well. When I was uh, 11 years old, um, I, I was uh, molested uh, by a friend of the family, and it really, it bothered me. You know, I, I grew up in a Christian home. Uh, my my grandparents are evangelist, and my dad was a minister. Um, so I don't know if you know anything about PKs, but we got a pretty heavy identity I do. Uh, about a preacher's kid, you know. Yeah. But uh, <clears throat> so uh, I was molested by uh, one of my mom's good friends. And uh, I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know how to handle that. I didn't know if it was right, if it was wrong. I was completely confused. And um some things happened where the police got called and um, <laughs> when the police came to interview us, I told them nothing had happened. And that went on for a long time. Uh, it, it went on for a few years of, of being molested. And so it, it caused even more confusion than what the uh, attention from my mother uh, the lack of attention from my mother caused. And so I believe that is where the, the sexual addiction uh, came into play. Uh, and a lot of the confusion, I just, I, I was seeking attention from a female and I was also uh, very confused about my sexual identity because of the, the man that had molested me. And then it played a bigger part into me because I didn't have the courage to tell anybody about it. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I was, I, I was, I was scared, you know, I, the judgment um, from the church and, and from the religion and, and all of that played a big part of it, uh, which eventually led me into my uh, substance abuse and my alcoholism. 
Absolutely. So I don't think that a lot of people really understand like the genuine nature of what sexual assault does to a child uh, when they can't process it and yeah. no child is equipped to process it and how it plays out later in manifesting and things like sexual dysfunction. You know, a lot of people will have, uh, you know, hypersexuality yeah. they'll experience. Um, and there's some people who will stray completely the other way away from sexuality and the unfortunate reality is that a lot of people's sexual dysfunction uh causes them to lead towards being more towards predators yeah um it can really go a lot of different ways and it can skew you for the rest of your entire life and i think that a lot of people think that like it's something that you go through and it's traumatic and then it's over and for those of us who have lived through it and survived it it's not over no. like it sticks with us for quite a yeah. long time until we learn to process it. And for a lot of us, that doesn't come until later in adulthood. Yeah. Especially those of us who don't feel like we have a safe place to go and talk about it. And there's always the added stigma. If you're a man, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, does this define me yeah. and my sexuality yeah. because a man did this to me? Yeah. And in all reality, it doesn't bro. No. You know what I'm saying? And I want you to know, like I hear it in your voice <clears throat> when you say that you carried like a little bit of guilt for not telling the police what was done to you. And I want you to know that like, as a child who was dealing with that, like however you processed that and wherever you were at in your healing process at the time, it's okay. Yeah. And, and you don't need to carry that man. Part of the biggest way that I've found to love myself as a human being was to understand that what was done to me was awful and it was horrific and it wasn't okay but it happened and I need to accept that and I need to let it go. And that doesn't mean that I need to forgive the other person, but it means that I need to forgive the situation and be able to move on in a healthy fashion. And that helped me start to love myself and heal again. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. Like, so publicly uh, saying that story uh, was the first time just, just then, you just know? now. Yeah. So I've talked to my sponsor about it mm -hmm. because I worked a 12 step program and I've told my fiance about it. But besides that, I don't think I've ever told anybody and I'm not going to lie. It feels that feels a little, I feel light. I feel, I feel free right now. And it, it makes me feel okay. Uh, you know, all those years that I felt like a coward, I felt like I just overcame that and it feels good. I'm going to tell you from my own personal experience, Brian, that um, I didn't talk about it with many people. Like, you know, I explained it to my parents in my mid twenties. Yeah. It happened when I was six years old. I talked about it to my parents in, in my mid twenties. Um, and then I talked to a sponsor about it and I talked to a therapist about it. And one night I was sharing at a 12 step meeting and I just knew, I knew I had to say it, bro. Like yeah. I felt compelled. I felt like, like God was compelling me that I needed to get this out and off my chest in a way that I couldn't take back. And it wasn't behind closed doors and it wasn't hush hush and it wasn't in hiding anymore. And I did. And it was the most freeing feeling. Yeah. It was the most freeing feeling and it didn't feel safe until afterwards. And then everything felt a little bit safer in my yeah. life. And I had four men come up to me after that meeting and tell me that they had had the same experience and that they have never been able to vocalize it to another human being. But because I was able to get up there and say it in front of a room full of people, they felt safe in, ex in saying it to me yeah. and getting it off their chest. Yeah. And that was the beginning of their healing process. So I guarantee you the fact that you felt that this was a safe place to come and talk about that. It's going to reach other people yeah. and they're going to feel a little bit safer. And I thank you for feeling like this was a safe enough place to share it with me. Absolutely. And, and JD, you did a, you did that for me. Uh, you made this a safe conversation for me to do that. You know, you've taken from hearing your other podcast, you have taken it, your message and you've made it cool. You've made it cool to be vulnerable. And that is what I think the world is lacking right now, especially us men that have been through the prison system and that have this big ego. And we have to live up to this certain masculinity level. You know what I mean? And you did, you've done that for me. You know, when I first listened to your podcast, it was uh, back in May, somebody, uh, one other peer had told me about you and I looked you up and, and that was one of the first things that I, that I heard out of your podcast was about you being sexually assaulted. And I said, if that man can do it, I can do it too. And it made me feel it, it, that's when it started for me. 
Uh, I just never knew that my higher power was going to line this up for me to let that out with the person that gave me the courage to do that. So I want to thank you for that. Absolutely. Oh man. It, the honor is all mine, bro. And, and I'm really glad that we have this opportunity and you brought up prison and you know that we're going to talk about prison. Uh, how many yeah. times you been to prison? Oh boy. I've been twice. Uh, went down the first time when I was 32, I'm 36 now in 2018. I got out in 2019. Uh, after I got out, I caught more charges within a very short time. I uh, ended up back in jail fighting a few more cases. Uh, then they ended up giving me uh, a 10 year sentence on this year uh, in 2021. And uh, I just got out in 2022. So January, January, I got out of the reentry program, which I uh, had an ankle monitor on for a little bit. So you got a 10 year sentence and you was out a year later. Is that because of the reentry program? Yeah. Yeah. So, well, I, it was 2023, not 2022. Okay. I did, I did about two years. Uh, and yes, yeah, so the reentry program, I went to the reentry program here in Arkansas. Uh, it was June, uh, mid June or mid July. And then it's a six months, pro six month program. Mm -hmm. And so what we do there is we wear an ankle monitor. Uh, we live inside of a, a facility and now it's a fucking nice facility. You know what I mean? Like we have beds and little kitchenettes and we eat good and we have jobs that we go out to in the free world and we get to wear clothes and have our uh, families bring up clothes and stuff for us to have there. So they really try to focus on re-entering us into society with a little bitty leash, mm -hmm. you know? And so we complete that 180 day program and then they release us on parole. That's awesome <clears throat> because I, I never got the opportunity for anything like that, yeah. but I think that we can't gloss over because every state is different. And we talk about this all the time on our channel. When we talking about prison, every state runs, they prisons differently. Yeah. And then the feds is different. Uh, you know, so I want to, I want to talk about Arkansas, how you get a 10 year sentence and be out in two years. Okay. So <clears throat> they do a, uh, <clears throat> they do a, a, it's like, I can't remember what percentage it is, uh, but for basically, so for every, uh, so for every, uh, you take you how many years you get, and then you divide it by two, I think is, or, or something like that. I can't, I can't remember exactly what it is. It's my understanding that you do about two to two and a half months on every year. Yeah. It's, it's about, it's about that. It's like it's crazy. 60 days. So why do they sentence you to uh, a year? But it, it works out to two and a half months. So what happened? Well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, but I do know that the new governor is cracking down on habitual offenders, uh, violent offenders. And now and they're trying to push it to 85 percent. I yeah. think Florida is like that right hey, now. That's what Oregon was like, too, yeah. was 85 percent. I know that you got like seven and a half percent time off for work time yep. if you're working yep. uh, and seven and a half percent off for good time if you're not getting in trouble. Yeah. Now, let's rewind back a little bit. Like, what was your first day of prison like? <laughs> My first day of prison. Uh, so this is back in 2018. And uh I was probably 190 pounds, 200 pounds. You know, I, I had been in county for about five months waiting to go. But uh, so here in Arkansas, when you come go into diagnostics, now this is my experience. Somebody else could probably tell you this same story and it'd be totally different. Always. But this is my experience. Uh, so you get there, you get on the bus. Well, it's a van from the county. And you go in, you drive uh, to Malvern, Arkansas. That's where Diagnostics is. And you're waiting in this uh, line of other vans with a, a, bu a bunch of other intakes. And when you get there, uh, for me, it was really cold that morning. And I'm sitting out in my little orange jumpsuit, freezing ass, uh, waiting to get inside. <clears throat> and then once you get inside, uh, it's like this little hall and they strip everybody down butt naked. Everybody naked in the hall. Everybody's naked in the hall. Dong swinging. Uh, yeah, m most of. I mean, my dong was swinging, but you know what I'm saying. Like, <laughs> so, yo, yo, is this where they is this where they do the squat and golf in this hall? Yeah. So, uh, so what they do is they they line everybody up on this wall. So you've got you've got uh, intakes 
all on the wall. And then they have this little room where you take, uh, you go in and you take off all your clothes, right? And then you squat and cough right there. And then you go back and you line up on the wall. So it's still naked? Nuts against butts. All, just all nuts against butts. Nuts against butts. Woo! You lined up, just inmate, 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 inmate. And then you go through a metal detector, and uh, I believe they have like a, a scanner that kind of sees if you got anything inside of you. Oh, shit damn. Like that. So you can't yeah. keister nothing in. I mean, you can, but it better not be metal or anything like that. I mean, I, I don't know. I, they, some some of the guys got tobacco in. Uh, I never smoked uh, any tobacco in prison. Because you knew it came from somebody's house. Because ass. I knew it was coming with the colon smell. You yeah. know what I'm saying? The colon but, uh, cologne on yeah, the tobacco. The, <laughs> yeah, on the tobacco. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so uh, I never really tried any of that uh, stuff in, in prison. I was pretty straight and narrow inside. Um, but yeah, man, you go through, they, they check you in, they take pictures of all your tattoos. Uh, they get all your information, your basic information. Uh, then they take you straight to a, a shower, uh, which these are nice showers. You don't have to shower with everybody. They got little, oh. little things. Now it has like the, the gate on it. You know what I'm saying? And, and little dividers. <clears throat> yeah. And little dividers. So, so you went like when you turned to, to yeah, I'm not you hitting Big nobody's Bob. Yeah. You know? Okay. So uh, but you wash down with the lice and then uh, you have to shave, uh, shave your all your facial hair off uh, for your intake picture. And then do they let you grow your shit back after that? Yeah, they do. Now you can grow it out. Uh, okay. So when, in county, uh, they didn't have any uh, razors or, or were they. Yeah, they didn't give us any razors or anything at this ADC holding facility I was in. And so my beard was just super long yeah, you and got bushy five months of beard yeah. and then what type of razor they give you to shave it with uh well you know those little orange razors single yeah, with blade the, with razors. The one single yeah, blade the ones that we bust off to get the blade out to cut the pickle with yeah so then, yeah. then how much of your face did that end up taking with that big ass beard uh, yeah it takes uh you know Take i've got i got a long chin so it could probably take a little bit off and i'd be good but but loan me some of that chin yeah i ain't got it under here <laughs> so, yeah right <laughs> I know you got some chin under that hair, man. I got a couple of them, but neither of them are long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, man, they take us through there. We get the showers, we do the shave, and then we go see medical. Uh, they take blood work. Uh, then we go into uh, to the these little offices one by one. And uh, they ask us about, uh, they do like a little intake questionnaire. Uh, ask us uh, what we did for our occupation. Do we have a substance abuse problem? Uh, there's just a did you lie? One. Oh, absolutely. I lied. Yeah, you're not going to program me. I lied me. through my teeth. Hell yeah, no. Yeah. I'm not programming. What's, what's your mean, yeah. substance abuse? Yeah, sh never. <laughs> what? But you're here. You've got like 14 possession charges on your record. Yeah. Huh? What? What <laughs> mine? Yeah. yeah. Must be another dirty dollar. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so you So you, they ask you the questions about STG, they ask you if you all clicked up and whatnot. Yeah, so they they check uh for uh any kind of tattoos, ask you if you're affiliated, and things Were like that. Were you affiliated? So, uh well, I clearly told them no, I was I wasn't. Uh but when uh I was in county, I started uh what they call prospecting. Mm -hmm. Uh and I had my paperwork and everything. So when I got in, I could show uh, the the affiliation that I was with that, look, I'm putting in my work. This is what it is uh, so that I'd be taken care of. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, which I thought I needed to be taken care of. It was my first time down. Yeah. Yeah. And I was a little little scared, you know, as a as a, as a white boy going into the prison, you know, here it's a it's a real race thing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a it, it's pretty divided. You know, okay. uh, which can can be kind of scary, especially well, it's scary when you're in county, you've never been to prison and that's all you're hearing. Mm -hmm. And then you've got uh, other people that have been to prison uh, <clears throat> and then they're talking to you and then they're all actually trying to recruit you into their affiliation. So it's like, well, fuck, yeah, I want to be a part of you, man. You're telling me I'll be protected. I'll have commissary and and I'll have a family. Like, and so at this age, when I was 32, uh, I was really doing some soul searching. Like, that's when I think my whole journey really started. That's when I realized that, you know, I had already been to treatment a couple of times, but that's when I was like, okay, this is where my addiction 
has gotten me. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I need to do something to change it. So when you, when you got in there, was the reality that you were taken care of, that you needed to be taken care of? Like, what was it when you really got there? Uh, Would you been okay if you weren't clicked up? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. (laughs) But it was all in here. You know, it was the, the perception and everything was like, uh, you know, fear, what, what the acronym for fear is, is false evidence appearing real. Mm-hmm. And so I can make all this evidence up in my head and, and, and think all these negative and, and crazy scenarios, but really it's all false bullshit. So was it a, was it a, a racial gang? Uh, that I was affiliated with? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Are you a racist person? No, not at all, man. You were just, not at all. You were just in fear. And you wanted to make sure that you were going to be okay. Yeah, uh, that had a big part of it. I think also what had a big part of it is I wanted to feel uh, part of something. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to feel like I had family. I wanted that. I was seeking that certain connection. Well, and that's how a lot of these gangs that are predatory operate, bro. They snare you. They hook you with that fear. They okie doke you into thinking that there's going to be some type of, you know, a connection and a bond and a family and loyalty. Is that the reality that you found when you were in there? <laughs> you know, uh, uh, so we'll talk about that a little bit because I'd, I'd love to get that off my chest. Uh, so when I went in and I had my paperwork, <clears throat> I was at diagnostics for like uh, like 10 days and then they shipped ship us to our units which is all over the states and we don't know what unit we're going to and when i get to my unit <clears throat> calico rock uh it just sounds dangerous but it's really not it's like the most weakest prison there is well maybe not the weakest but it's it's you know ran by uh white guards so they don't let anything happen and there's nothing really coming in and out there's no fighting i mean there's fighting of course but uh but anyways, I get to my <clears throat> my barracks, uh, barracks seven, and uh, I walk in and I'm shaking like a stripper, you know, like there's just all these people and they're just running around doing their thing. I mean, it's open barracks and uh, <clears throat> I find my my rack. And uh, so I start putting my little bit of shit I got into my box and and trying to get comfortable, make my bed. And uh, I lay down and I'm like, sh- and I start thinking, I'm like, shit, I'm going to have to find one of uh, these family members and I'm going to have to show them my paperwork. And I'm just shaking the whole time. I'm like, oh, man, this is real. You know, it finally the reality setting in. And <clears throat> it was cool when I was in county because I knew, dude. Mm-hmm. And I had that connection, but to come up to somebody, I didn't know what they were going to do. Again, I had this this fear in my head that I was going to have get heart checked and I was going to have to fight and I was going to have to do this. And I didn't know what to prepare for. Um, But uh, a couple of days, I, it took me a couple of days to like work up the courage to be like, OK, this is my paperwork. I'm on this list. You know, I'm part of I'm part of the cool kid club. You know what I mean? And uh, so finally I did it. And when I was going to give him my paperwork, I had actually had his name in my Bible and he was right next to me. So I was like, OK, this is supposed to happen, you know, because I don't believe in coincidences. I was mm-hmm. like, this is it's meant to be. He's my neighbor. He's right here in my Bible. You know, this is the guy that they told me to meet up with. And we're at the same unit and all this other shit. So <clears throat> I give it to him. He goes and gets on the phone. And uh, he comes back and he goes, yep, he's good. All checks out. He's in the book. And I was like, thank God, you know. And uh, so what what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to uh, after if you're if you're prospecting, what you do is you have to get someone else to pick up that sponsorship. That's what they call it, a sponsor. And uh, I didn't really want to ask anybody else to pick me up. You know what I'm saying? And. So, because I was really nervous about it. Well, a few, a few of the guys that that seen my paperwork, they, they went ahead and they kind of like temporarily picked me up while I was in their barracks, and uh, <clears throat> they gave me assignment. I had to write an essay 
And uh, I'm a pretty decent writer. Uh, I can really like put it out there on paper. And so I had to write this this program, this essay about what the affiliation meant to me. And when I wrote this thing, it took me like two days to write it, but I wrote it in a way that just like juiced up the whole affiliation. They were they were so excited about it. They were like, oh, man, this is great. You know what I'm saying? You know, like when you get that that certain person that lights that fire under your ass and you get yeah. all motivated and to do something again. So and, they okie doked you at first and then you you were okie doking them back. Yeah, pretty it's much. kind of like a mating <laughs> ritual. Here. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I like that. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely mutual. Uh, so, but I was just I was terrified the whole time, yeah. you know, because I didn't know what was happening. I didn't know what to expect. I honestly, to me, like the idea of like writing out an application or an essay about like being in a security threat group. Yeah. Like that's that's crazy to me because like you don't tell the police where I'm from in prison uh, or or put down any proof until you're like getting it tattooed on you. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like because you don't want them to know who you are right that anonymity has certain safety to it and so the fact that like my first day when i went to you know went to see my counselor and they marked me off as stg they hit me right up front right in the face <laughs> of it you know what i'm saying yeah. before i was even in a gang and yeah. um kind of set me up for failure but they they literally had you write out an essay yeah i had to write out an essay uh, i had to write out the uh bylaws and and the concepts and the precepts and like I had to do all that. And then it sounds that was like scary. a test. Yeah. This don't sound fun at all. No, it wasn't fun. But I'll tell you what, like what really interested me in all of this is like when I did read uh, the the precepts and the concepts and I studied them, they resonated with me uh, because there wasn't anything in those uh, that that literature that was racist. OK. And and so I was like, OK, I can get down with this. Like. You know, they they said in in that literature, it was like we don't hate anybody. Now they they did say they hate one that one thing, but I I, I don't really want to. Yeah, don't say it. Yeah, don't say <laughs> it. I don't really. It's something say that it. didn't you know, But it wasn't a race. You. It, it, you know, they they weren't about uh, hating races. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you know, it was just it it was I was like, okay, I can get this this. But I think what I liked so much about it was that it gave me structure. Yeah, it was like it gave me a code. It gave me a, a moral code that I had to uh, follow. Mm -hmm. And I think I really was like searching for that uh, my entire life outside of uh, the religion, because that was really the only literature that I ever had. And then when I was shown this, I was like, oh, yeah, I can get down with that. And I, I mean, I felt kind of gangster doing this shit, too. You know <laughs> it saying? does feel a little bit gangster <laughs> doing this does. shit, don't it? It does, man. It does. So how did it end up? Did you, was that, are those your people? Is that, uh, yeah. did they have your back? Uh, so <clears throat> about 30 days into my, uh, my stay there, uh, we were, uh, uh, there was a Chomo that came in and uh, another affiliation uh, had to paper check them, right? Mm -hmm. Check their paperwork. Uh, we call it Time Card Tuesday uh, in in ADC, but uh, and it just happened to be Tuesday, and uh, dude just come walking in. So this affiliation had two other prospects that were trying to uh, earn that special tattoo, you know, and they come up and uh, they said, "Let me see your paperwork." And Chomo was like, "Fuck you! I ain't showing you shit." Yeah, so how did that turn out for him? Yeah, it didn't turn out too well. It yeah. was the it was the day that I was introduced to uh, that uh, orange looking pepper spray that just gets all <laughs> over your fucking face. Okay, yeah. you got to run this down, bro. So, what happened? <clears throat> okay, so uh, they're up on my my tier. So in the barracks, you have a upper tier and lower tier, and uh, they come up the 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 stairs, and they're standing there and. Um, <laughs> They said, let me, let me see your time card. Dude's like, fuck you. I'm not doing it. And they just start beating the brakes off of him. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they, how many, uh, well, there was two at first and then I think there ended up to being like four or five. Yeah. Was he a tough chomo? Uh, he was like six, six, 
Ooh. He was a big dude. Yeah, yeah. You know but, but did he got them hands on him? Uh, well, <clears throat> he tried for a little bit. You know, the the two prospects, uh, the beginning, uh, they were a little smaller. Yeah. You know, and and I think the the affiliation was really just trying to heart check them to see if they were going to do it. Yeah, send a couple small dudes after a six yeah. six dude. Yeah, and then they did it, and they were like, "Oh shit, okay, well, the heart heart check is good." Uh, and so a couple more people came in there. And here's the crazy thing about this is like I didn't, I wasn't involved in any of that. <clears throat> I mean, that was a totally different family, you know. Yeah. And I'm just watching it from my rack and like uh, we have bars on the windows and they smash dude's head up against the bar and his ears like hanging off and dangling and shit. His ear was hanging off and dangling. Yeah. So he hit him on the window and the bar cut his ear and it was just like it was nasty. It was nasty. And it's just the first prison fight that I got to witness, you know. Yeah. So the cop, the, the cops come in. And uh, they start uh, spraying people and trying to break it up. And uh, <clears throat> they finally, they get them down from the top tier onto the bottom tier. Because, I mean, they're beating the brakes off, dude, you know. And uh, it never works out good when you don't show them the paperwork, man. No, it doesn't. Just show you them might the paperwork. Just, you might all just show them the paperwork yeah. and then take your ass whooping. It's going to be a whole lot less severe than if you try yeah, to absolutely. nut up on some gang members. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. You, you just put them in a position they have. You made them an offer they can't refuse. Right. I mean, and, and you know, in Arkansas, Chomos don't have any say so. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, we the, they the 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 gangs, they run shit and there's different affiliations, which there's politics. Um, I mean, I've heard that there's better politics in other states, but this is the only state I've been locked up in. And so that's what I know. But, uh, yeah, they, they ended up taking them, uh, they sprayed the whole barracks. And so this is also not just my first prison fight to witness. And, and, uh, this is my first time, uh, experiencing gas mm -hmm. and spray mm -hmm. and I'm dying. It ain't nothing nice. It is not fun. <laughs> oh, dog. It is not fun. Cause there's no, there's no windows to be open in there. There's yeah. no fans. That shit is just like lurking around. And so, so I they learned, got no real ventilation going on in there. Man, uh, just not the that little I tiny know ass of. vents that got all that lint stuck in them. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. You don't even see those. You yeah, know? You're just breathing in other dudes the yeah. whole time. Oh, it's not Oof. fun at all. It's nasty. It's real nasty. It smells real good in there, though. You know. Oh yeah, yeah. no, no. I, I think it's called Bedoil. The Badusi. The Badusi. The Badusi. <laughs> the Bud yeah. and Pussy. Yeah. But uh, they, they end up taking these guys, these five guys to the, the hole. And uh, <clears throat> remind you, my uh, out date, like I was going to, my TE date, transfer eligibility date is coming up on like uh, January 12th, I think. And this is right before Christmas. And uh, so we, we, after they go to the hole, a bunch of us are in a circle and we're talking about what happened. <clears throat> well, the next morning I'm asleep and here come the the whole team, the all 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 the 12 in the building, they're they're coming into the barracks and they start calling names. And like I ain't worried, you know what I'm saying? I had nothing to do with it. <clears throat> and then I hear my name. Mr. Donahoe, pack your shit. And I'm like, what the fuck? So, no, they didn't even tell me to pack my shit. They just told me to come. They fucked my slides, all that. They're they're not worried about none of that. Get over here to the door. So the they all just said cuff up. Yeah, cuff up, like straight up. So I walk down there and I'm in boxers, you know, uh, my beautiful white boxers. And they call like seven or eight of us out of there. And they have us lined up on the wall <clears throat> outside in the hall. And they're putting us all in cuffs and we're down on our knees with cuffs facing the wall. And they start taking us to the hole. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on? Like I had nothing to do with any of this. Were they just lining up everybody that had STG? Uh, well, they were lining up everybody that was in that circle after the fight. Oh, okay. So here's where the sick shit comes in is that the, the 
the cops were protecting the chomo. They do. Yeah, and see, it was kind of bullshit. Yeah. So they took us all, and they start hitting us with all these disciplinaries. And uh, they hit us with uh, banding together, STG, agitating, provoking a fight. Um, there was like six disciplinaries. I don't even remember all of them. But uh, <clears throat> so we're in there and uh, they, they've got two of us in each cell and they just lock us up, man. And uh, then our, our co court date, our disciplinary date comes up a couple days after and they find me guilty. So <clears throat> nobody is supposed to know that I'm a prospect. You know what I mean? And I'm, I'm getting to the point of the story here with the, the whole um, uh, loyalty shit that I thought was involved with all this. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> so we're, we're in there and I, I get, I found guilty of these disciplinaries. They give me 30 days. Now this was like a week before Christmas uh, on January 12th. I'm supposed to go home. So when you get in trouble and catch a disciplinary, they have classes here. It's like class, uh, class two, class three, class four, and like class one is parole eligible. You can go home class four. It takes you 60 days to go to class three, class three. It takes you 30 days to go to class two, class two it takes you 30 days to go back to class one. And, uh, they hit me with class four. So I'm, I'm fucked. Yeah. You know, and, and this is the first time I'm in prison. I'm in the hole. Um, my birthday is January 6th. So now I've spent Christmas, my first, my first Christmas in the hole, mm -hmm. uh, my birthday in the hole and it's cold and dark. I don't know if you've ever been in the hole. Oh, I spent a lot of time in the hole. Yeah. It's no fun. Yeah, Christmas in the hole ain't nothing nice. It's, it's bro. no fun. No commissary, no phone calls, yep. no TV, mm -hmm. nothing like that. And it's too cold to go outside. So, you know, most, most of the time they do like 23 and one. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're in there 23 hours, get out an hour a day for rec time or whatever, but it's so cold. I'm not trying to go outside. No. I'm not trying to do none of that. No. So it's 24 and hours in the hole for me for 30 days. Now, were they, how often <clears throat> were you getting showers a week? Uh, so it was like twice a week. Were they walking you on a leash? Oh yeah. Up so, on a leash? so you get shackled and cuffed. Yep. And then they two two officers, two guards. They walk you to the shower. They lock you in there. Then they take the cut the cuffs off, the shackles yep. off, and they put that little bar of soap over there for you. Yeah, yeah. You know that good soap that really gets all the grime and shit yeah, off that you. Lot extra limey soap. Yeah, it's great. <clears throat> Uh, but the good thing about it was like that shower was hotter than the shower that was in the barracks mm -hmm. and they didn't put a time limit on my shower. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. So it really wasn't that bad. And it was private. Like I didn't have anybody else in there to shower with. So, you know, I'm Mr. Bright. So to look for the good shit and all the stories. Always. Yeah. Got Always got to gotta find the got positive to. and the negative <laughs> brother. Got to, but yeah, man, I get, I get out <clears throat> and uh, get out of the hole and they moved me to the other other hall and uh find out that like the guy that was supposed to be sponsoring me like over my my shit uh is actually the one that told them that i was involved okay and i was like you know what that's really that's dirt snake yeah it was like and you know it was all hearsay but it felt right mm -hmm. you know what i mean like it felt like that was the truth not here but like in my gut uh, because he disappeared after the fight that happened. And that's why he wasn't in the circle. And then they called him back out, which I know, you know, like he, the yard rep always has pool with the with with the guards and shit. But like he was gone for a while. And so that makes a lot of sense to me. So like he, they might have they might have put some screw to him. Yeah. And you were the newest dude, the lowest dude on the totem pole. Yeah. And he might have just thrown you under the whole bus to. Yeah, I think just to see if I would hold water or whatever, whatever the reason or was. Or to get him out of some trouble. Yeah, that's most likely it. That's, 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 that would be my read. Yeah. I've done a lot of politicking in my time in yeah, prison. It was, it was kind of fucked up, man. Yeah, man. Like, I so, feel like if he, if he wanted to save me, he could have saved me. So did you uh, did you tell him you wanted to withdraw your application <clears throat> to be one of the boys? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I did that, man. And that was probably uh, <clears throat> one of the bravest things that I had ever done. Mm -hmm. Uh, <clears throat> so when I got out and I heard that I started really doubting 
my loyalty to this this group. And so they were like, after that, they, they considered me going to the hole and keeping my mouth shut as putting in work. And I was like, okay, well, that really wasn't work to me. That was me getting fucked. But uh, I, I go and uh, they're like, all right, brother, we're ready to put that patch on you. You know what I mean? And uh, I was like, okay. And they were like, you just need to do one thing first. They were like, this dude is telling on our bro for having cell phones and now he's locked in the hole and they didn't know that I was in the hole with that, that bro, you know what I mean? And, uh, they were like, we just need you to smash him out. And then we throw that, that ink on you. And I was like, hold up, man. Y'all don't even got the facts. Like I already know about this situation before y'all even come and told me now y'all are wanting me to do some bogus shit for y'all to look, make y'all look good. This, this is a 19 year old kid. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, <clears throat> that's when I really, that's when I had made my decision. I'm done. Like mm -hmm. there's nothing courageous about what they're trying to have me do. And, uh, so for a couple of weeks, man, I'm like, I'm like, really, I'm praying, you know, and, and at that, to that first prison trip, I was really, uh, in that jailhouse religion like asking God for all these amazing things to, to happen. And that's not like I found out later, that's not really how that works. You know what I'm saying? But uh, <clears throat> I'm like, all right. I'm like, God, if you can just get me out of this one, you know, I don't know if you've ever said that prayer. Oh yeah. Yeah. But <laughs> I'm like, if you can just get me out of this one, I'll do anything that you want me to do. So uh, a couple of weeks go by and uh, they're like, all right, we're ready for you to pull it, man. Today's the day. And, uh, I, I just tell him, I was like, you know what, this is, this isn't setting right with me. I had to sit with them in the chow hall and explain that what they got ain't for me, What you, what you guys are trying to do isn't righteous with the moves that you're making. I don't, I don't see fit for, for what I got for in my heart and see for myself. And, uh, so I cut it off, man. And, and that was probably the bravest thing I'd ever done. And, and the repercussion of it, like I told him, I was like, man, if y'all are, if y'all are trying to catch a fade, y'all, you know, don't sneak me. I was like, I don't care if you got to put two on me or whatever, but we can go over here and we catch that shit real quick, get it over with, but don't you sneak me. Cause it's going to piss me off. You know, like I'm, it's going to be some, some, some retaliation from that shit. Uh, so they were like, no, no, we're good. You don't have any ink on you. Uh, you, you just hand over your paperwork and that'll be that. I was like, bet. So I gave them, gave up my paperwork and, uh, <clears throat> they never retaliated on me, man. They never, they didn't sneak you. They never snuck me, bro. My whole thing, my whole thing would be, uh, because you know, a lot of the times, uh, you know, the politics is that they can't send a torpedo on one of their own, even if the person walks away. Yeah. But like, bro, if they sent a chomo after me, if they sent a chomo after me to take me off main line, I'd have to come back, bro. I'd have to put something yeah. in them. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's, I've seen other yeah. gangs do that, bro, just to add, like, disrespect to it. Yeah. Like, I spit, I like to spit on the palm of my hand and open hand clap a man in the face yeah. just to let him know open hand means I don't think you're a threat. And the spit, that's just to let you know your place, dog. Right. You know what I'm saying? But I've seen other gangs send a chomo. To take him off main line. They it's knew he fun. wasn't going to win. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? They, the see. Chomo wasn't going to yeah. win, but they're just sending him to the hole for six months for, you know, a fight yeah. by sending a Chomo after him. But they never, they never came back. They they did it. That, that's actually pretty solid. That's square. Yeah. Because I've seen a lot of gangs that like it, the prospect period should be a prospect for both sides. It yeah. should be a prospect for the prospect to decide, is this my politics? Is this my crew? Is this how I want to ride? Do these people align with my beliefs and my morals, yeah. which clearly these guys didn't align with you. Right. And it also should be for the organization to decide, is this person good for someone us. who's a fit for yeah. us? So they let you walk. Yeah, that's they did. That's cool. They you got to respect that. Dog. Yeah, I do. I definitely do respect that. It hurt a little bit, though, you know what I'm saying? Because, like, that whole stay up to that point, <clears throat> it was probably, I mean, I, I was in for, like, four months uh, until that happened. And uh, I had gained relationships with these guys. You know, oh, those, yeah. those were the people that I connected with. And uh, after that moment, 
Like I'd be walking down the hallway and they'd be in their barracks because we've got big windows you can see through the hall. Mm-hmm. And when I'd walk by the barracks, they'd turn their back to me. They ain't had nothing for you no more. They had, they didn't have shit yeah. for me. It and reminds me of it. Re, it reminds me of having like really good friends snitch on me, bro. Yeah, like nobody, no relationship ever broke my heart as much as like a dude I really cared about doing a control buy on me, trying to get me thirty years in prison, bro. Uh, like straight up trying to get me on on a trafficking controlled buy trying to put me away for the rest of my entire life. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. when you're 40 years old and somebody's trying to put you in for 30, that's cold. Yeah, that's Especially cold if it's well. someone that you would have gone in the paint for, bro. Yeah. I mean, that, there's a different type of feeling to that. There's yeah. a, it's a, it hits different. It's a vibe, bro. Yeah. You know, I'm glad I never had to experience that. And I think that's uh, so like when I get, when I, when I get on one, I, um, uh, I remove myself from all of those type of relationships. Like, so I don't really have any good friends in addiction. Mm -hmm. Like we're all dirt bags. You know what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. so like, of course, like if I'm getting high with you, yo, you're my homeboy, man. You what's up? I got you. I ain't really got you. You know what I'm saying? But, uh, it got to a point like where I just, I would take myself away from the situation. Like I've been all around the country I've been in state to state, city to city, and it was like I was just kept trying to – I'd burn these bridges, so I'd go over here to this, and I'd burn those bridges, and I'd go across. I've been from Connecticut to Washington to Arizona, Ohio, West Virginia, North Carolina, Florida, Oklahoma, Texas. Like I've burnt – Cali, like I've burnt, burnt all my bridges all over and it's like, I can only stay there for so long until everything causes chaos and then I'm off. So we get a general idea for how he was living, my yeah. man. Let's talk about the solution. Okay. When did you know that it was enough and what did you do to get out of that life? Because I want people, people have heard the chaos and the depravity and, and some of the consequences. What was your quintessential moment? What was your turning point? Okay, man, that's a, that's a really good question. My turning point <clears throat> for my life was uh, <sighs> I had I had gained everything. So I had uh, in 2020, was it 2020? Yeah, 2020, uh, what had happened <clears throat> was I went and bought a, a $5 scratch off and I hit for a hundred thousand dollars no on the way lot. yeah a hundred thousand dollars off a five dollar scratch off yeah it was it was it was insane was, was that the worst thing that ever happened to you in the end that is so that was at that moment i thought it was the best thing that could happen to me of course but it ended up being what took me all the way down through there i know that's right bro like you give an addict money and ne enough is never enough. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's curtains, bro. It's yeah. a wrap. When 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 a bunch of people got that money that they gave us for the COVID stimulus checks, yeah. I, there were a lot of dudes in the sober house that I was working at that when they got that $1,200 check, uh, they flew, they fell off, and a lot yeah. of them didn't make it, bro. Yeah. A lot of them hit the cemetery. Well, they're they're not even burying people anymore. They're just cremating them. That's so but a lot of people got that $12 check, and it killed them, bro. Yeah, yeah, man. That's what. It, that's what happened to me, man. Like, <clears throat> but I believe like in order to, in order for me to find <clears throat> my light, I had to experience complete and total darkness. Yeah. And that, that lottery ticket was my ticket in, in you know, in retrospect, it was my ticket to my light, mm -hmm. but it took me all the way to total darkness. It, it ruined every relationship I had going for myself every dream that I had for myself. Like I'm a big dreamer. Uh, you know, I see the big picture in a lot of things. And so I wanted to do all this great, all these great things with this money. Like I wanted to go around and I wanted to do a documentary on helping people find their purpose. But as an addict, it was impossible because I had no purpose for myself. So you were getting high wanting to help people find their purpose. Yeah. So you still had your heart in good places. Yeah. But you were lost. Yeah, absolutely. I call it, you know, I was a dirt bag with morals. So what what at what point did you become found, brother? 
Okay, so the point that I became found was when all that money, uh, everything that I had bought with it, like, bro, I was walking around looking like Flavor Flav. I had all, <laughs> fucking, I had 18 karat gold chains, had two or three of them on my neck. I had, like, I had turned that 100000 into almost $750,000 within 45 days. Yeah. By gambling and, and flipping and fraud and all kinds of stuff. And uh, <clears throat> I'd lost it all, man. And it, within a month and a half, everything uh, I had, I had bought a, I had bought like five cars. I was rolling around on Hummers in a Hummer H3 on 22s, and I had BMWs and I had Mazdas and I had all these vehicles. Lost every one of them. Uh, you know. It, I lost all my clothes. I had top notch clothing. Like my wardrobe was so hard. Mm -hmm. uh, I had every pair of vans that you could imagine. Uh, but I lost it all. All my chain, all my jewelry, all my cologne, all my clothes. And uh, I didn't even have a place to live. Like I remember there was one point before I found my light uh, that I was walking around the uh, uh, casino for two days in muck boots like water boots, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And when I got back to my homegirl's house, I took them off and it smelled like rotten cheese. Like it was just spoiled milk. And I had these big blisters on my feet from just walking around sweating, but I didn't care because I was just trying to make more money, Yeah, which I kept making the money and losing the money. And, and I was just so lost, man. I was so spiritually damaged. I was, I mean, my mind, my body and my spirit was just dead. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so one night, <clears throat> uh, was it a night? Yeah, I think it was, uh, I was, uh, going, leaving the casino and got pulled over. We had just, we were in Oklahoma. We caught, crossed over to the Arkansas state line and a state trooper, uh, blue lighted us and I'm in the passenger seat and like, you know, I didn't have to give my name or my ID or anything. And I knew I had warrants. And uh, they took me in, man. And that was the day that uh, I got in the back of the cop car and I was like, it's over, bro. Like, I'm done. I can't live like this anymore. I can't do this for for any any minute longer. I can't do this shit. Mm -hmm. And um, they transferred me back here to Hot Springs, Garland County. And they booked me on, uh, uh, I think it was like eight felony charges, eight new felony charges. And I think I ended up beating two of them uh, through taking a deal, but they gave me uh, uh, three six-year sentences and a ten-year sentences and ran them consecutive. Damn. I mean, uh, uh, concurrent. Concurrent. Okay. My bad. My bad. Yeah. So, like, you had a ten-year sentence, though. Yeah, it was ten years. The ten years ate up the other six years. Yeah. Yeah. So, <clears throat> in that time, man, like, that's where I found my light, bro. Like. That's where I was like, okay, so who am I? Started asking myself these questions. Like, I hated myself. I looked in the mirror. It got so bad, I couldn't even look at myself in the mirror. I didn't even want to brush my teeth in the mirror. Mm -hmm. I just had to look at myself. And so every morning, like, I would get up and I, off my rack, and I would look in that mirror, and I would just ask the question, who are you? Mm -hmm. Like, who are you? Like, why don't you love yourself? What's wrong with yourself? So I would go to the book rack in uh, in this in this Garland County Jail. Uh, you know, you don't we don't get to go to the library. They bring a book card in, and uh, this is like when I started to really believe in uh, a higher power of my own understanding, not what the religious higher powers were taught and and all that. <clears throat> but I would go through and I would start finding books that like just stood out to me and I would start reading them. And, uh, I came across a book, uh, it's written by an author named Neil Donald Walsh. And these books are called conversations with God. And they set me on this spiritual journey to love myself again, find myself again, uh, enjoy being with myself. Like, I mean, you've been locked up. You spent a lot of time with yourself. Mm -hmm. Like, you, I mean, why not become your best friend? You know what I'm saying? And so that's what I did, man. I started finding this. Uh, I had to forget everything that I knew to learn something 
uh, everything that I had known to learn something new. And so that's what these books and, and this literature taught me. Um, so I'm, I'm just back at it and I'm starting to discover this light little by little. And through this last prison sentence, uh, I figured I figured out who I am, you know, and, and somebody when they asked me that question, who are you? I kept answering it with all these things outside of myself. And I never really understood what the question was actually asking. And uh, <clears throat> even though I, I am against all religions, uh, I found the answer in the Bible. And the, the, the question was, Moses asked God, said who, who to ask God to tell him who, he, who God was. And God said, I am who I am. And I started looking at that and it was like, I am who I am. Well, how is that answering? Like it was a divine moment for me, mm -hmm. you know, like for me to stumble across that. And, and then that is what connected with me. And I started to realize like, I am nothing more than my being. I'm a human being, not a human doing. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing else for me to be like, just be me. And so when I started understanding that it didn't take anything away, anything out here in this external world to be the internal self and, and find that love for myself, it was just a, it was a long spiritual awakening. Like and to be worthy. Yes. Worthy. Just how you are flawed. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Perfectly. Broken imperfect. in certain places, Yeah, you know, still beautiful and loving and kind in other places prone to mess up at any moment, but worthy every second yeah. of that. Yeah, absolutely. Because the love that the love that I started to understand was unconditional. Absolutely. You know, um, I learned in there that what pure love was mm -hmm. and pure love demands nothing, asks nothing and expects nothing. So what are you doing today? Tell the people, what it is that you do today. I'm not asking okay. you who you are. I'm asking you, what are you doing today? Okay. Because I think it's pretty inspirational. So <clears throat> uh, when I got out of the reentry center, uh, the reentry program through the prison uh, in uh, January, they cut, I cut that ankle monitor off. Um, uh, I found out that about what they call a peer support specialist. And I was like, what is this man? Like, what, what, what do they do? What, you know, what, what is this all about? And they said, well, th they told me what a peer does. And they told, they explained to me that a peer uses, uh, I would use my lived experience for the better mm -hmm. to help other people understand and relate to them on a, per on a personal level an eye to eye level, like not an authority level I can stand with them and, and understand. And I don't have to give them, uh, tell them what to do or tell them how to do it. I'm just a ear to listen to. And when I found out that that was a possibility and, and really I'd been doing that for years, even through my addiction, like I've, I've always wanted to help people and, and understand people and just allow people to talk and vent to me and, and just be there to care for them. And then I found out that there's a salary that goes with that. You know what I'm saying? Like I can get paid to do what I love to do mm -hmm. and encourage people to um, live in a recovery state and, and recover their lives back and rebuild their relationships. And I get to use my experience on how I did that and share that with everyone else. That's beautiful, man. So I'm a peer support specialist. Well, I'm actually a peer in training. Uh, I go to take my core, my Arkansas core exam, uh, on September 14th, which will certify me as a peer support specialist. So yes, sir. it's a, it's a, it's a huge, uh, accomplishment for me to be able to work under the state, uh, uh with a state and DHS uh, certification and be able to do that, man. And where are you working as a peer? So I was working at, <laughs> I was working at the reentry center that I graduated from. So the the place that you actually got out of your incarceration, you're working back there with those folks. Do you know how full circle that is? Yeah, Do you know a, how prophetic that is yeah, in and really of its cool. core, man? It it was it was uh 
what was awesome about it was the people that run the center, the run the reentry center. They're the ones that invited me back and pushed for me to get into the training because of the way you carried yourself. Because the way, you were there. yeah, absolutely. Uh, they knew that the, there was something inside of me. They saw something in me that I didn't really quite see about myself. Mm-hmm. And they they understood that what I had to offer for the people going through this program uh, at a pure level was something that nobody else could bring to the table. You understand that that in and of itself speaks <clears throat> in volumes about the man that you are. You should be proud of what you've accomplished, brother. I'm proud of you. Thank you, man. And I'm definitely proud of myself. Uh, you know, I'm I'm hard on myself and uh, I don't quite see it the way that everybody else sees it. Uh, because for me, it's just a continuing process. It's always going to be a continuing yeah. process, man. The second that we're done progressing, uh, we're boring, bro. We're boring. <laughs> it's done. We stopped. Yeah. We stopped growing. We stopped changing. We stopped evolving, and we stopped being as effective of healers. The second that we're done, yeah. And, yeah. and that's why I pray to never be done. Yeah, there's. You know, I heard uh, one of my favorite podcasters. Uh, he said, "The second that you peak, you're over with." Yeah. He said, that's what you should be afraid of. You just keep pushing. You know, when I would do groups with the guys at the reentry center, I would tell them it's never about the destination. It's all all about the journey. It's all about the process. Enjoy the trip. Mm-hmm. Every every lived experience, every lived moment, that is what the, where, that's where the beauty is. Don't ever forget that. And because I, I have it and I've had to remind myself about that through all the situations I've been through. Just imagine... How many people and like a lot of the times what we do is we plant seeds in others that we'll never see the fruit of. Yeah. We'll never see the fruit. You know, people said to, things to me four years before I was ready to hear them. But it was a peer. It was somebody who, who had been down the same path as me. Absolutely. So when I needed to hear it, when I was ready. Yeah. To make the changes, yeah. that voice was clear as day. Yeah, click. And your voice is going to have a profound impact and a ripple effect on the people because everybody whose life you change for the better, yeah. they're going to pass that on to somebody else. Yeah, and I that's how so. we change the world, brother. That's yeah. how we win this war. Yeah, that's all. That's all I hope, man. Thank I'm really you. proud of you. Thank, Thank you for you. taking the time to sit and talk with us today, man. I'm sure that your story is absolutely going to inspire and reach the ears of the people out there. And, uh, Man, I just want you to know how proud of you I am. Thank you very much, man. Right on. Thank you very much. All right, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. As always, I love you. One love. I'm out.